All right. So one of the things that we talked about is, so if A is M by N, AX equaling B, you know, what sort of thing does this look like? So if I had, for example, A, one, two, one, and negative one, zero, one, and then multiply this by, say, x1, x2, x3, and this spits out. Okay, what if, so this guy here is two by three. What's the dimension of x? Zero. It's a three by one. It's obviously gonna spit out a what? Zero. A two by one, and say this is b1, b2. Now, a lot of times when we have these problems, we're given things like, you know, sometimes if I would give you numbers here, could you find that? Yeah, do you know how to matrix multiply? Sometimes we would give numbers over here, could you find that? And the answer is maybe. It's like how do I solve it? I would be solving a system of equations. We would do the techniques necessary to solve the system of equations. I would find no solution, one solution, or an infinite number of solutions. If you find solutions at all, we use the word consistent. If there's no solutions, it is inconsistent. If the right-hand side is all zeros, it is called what type of system? Homogeneous. Homogeneous. Like, that's a good question. Homogeneous. Right. It's like, I say homogeneous all the time, and it's homogeneous, but we say it's homogenized milk. Anyways, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, how do, you, how do you say English? Well, if you say, if there's a word and, it, and you're going to say it wrong, say it with confidence. That's important. <laughs> It's always fun, like with my name, everybody, it's like you go sit down and you say my last name. It's like, it's always fun when there's somebody drunk. Aerosmith, <laughs> hey, like the band? No, it's not like the band. <laughs> <laughs> it's not how you say it. Anyways. Um, so when we have this, it's taking a three dimensional object and spinning a two dimensional object out of it. One of the ways of this particular problem in this form is we could imagine that three-dimensional objects come in. So this is three space. I multiply anything in here, an x, which is a three-dimensional object, and it comes out over here, some sort of b, which happens to be in two-dimensional space. So we act like this is a, this is a function. It's moving three-dimensional objects and spitting out two-dimensional objects. Now, we've already studied this, and we talked about, OK, that's what that does. There was one thing that we studied in particular for it, which was the null space. And so we would look in here, and inside of here was a subspace, which is the null space of A, which is a subspace. It, cont it contains the zero object. And what was the null space of A? The null space of A was all those objects x such that a times x becomes a zero object, but this zero object is way, you know, over here is the origin, right? There's the origin, and that is the zero object of R2. And over here, this is three-dimensional space, right? And over here is, that guy right there is the zero object, but this is a zero object, object of R3. It's a zero, 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 which is not zero, zero. <coughs> it's a completely different space. How did we find that? Well, we found that by setting it equal to zero. In other words, if I would go back to, say, like this problem, if I would like to find, like, this span, like right here, how did you find the null space? You would go through here and take the vectors themselves, set them equal to 0, 0, 0, and solve it. And then that particular solution, you have your free variables and other aspects. That would be the three-dimensional, for that for the problem I had below, it would be the three-dimensional object that is embedded within three space, every one of which goes to the origin. So they get crushed. So it's the null space. If it ends up that the, that the matrix is invertible, the origin always goes to the origin, right? That's the trivial solution. If that's the only one who does that, then we would say, oh, matrix A is invertible. Now, 
that's something that we studied about this. But A itself being this 1, 2, 1, negative 1, 0, 1. So obviously A takes the null space and crushes it to the origin. So there's this subspace on the left-hand side, which I can consider the domain, that <coughs> obviously exists because of what A is. You know, it's, it's, if I pick a different A, I'll have a different null space. So it's, it's dependent upon A. And words for this particular space, so if we would study that one, what would be the null space of this A? Being all X such that AX equals zero. Well, we would just take the, how do you do this? You would go through it and say, all right, what do I do? I take one, two, one, negative one, zero, one, and augment this with zero, zero. I want to figure out who goes to zero, zero. How do we figure that out? We put it in reduced row echelon form. So not just row echelon form. Let's go ahead and go full reduced row echelon form. So full reduced row echelon form says, I'm going to make a zero down below this one. Let's add the two together. I get one, two, one, zero, zero, two, two, zero. Obviously that two, two, pretty easy for me to just go ahead and make it one, one. Now what's next? Who's my lead variables? Lead, lead. Now for reduced row echelon form, what do I do? Make zeros above the lead variables. What's the only guy I gotta get rid of? That two right there. And probably, if we would look at that, it would have been probably easier for me is to have left those twos to make that a two because I'm gonna have to multiply the twos back, right? So you always can go through it and like not follow the rules specifically, just knowing what you're wanting to get. And so that would be zero, two, two, zero. If I subtract row one minus row two, what would this be? One, zero, zero. One, zero negative, one. negative one. Those are still zeros. Go ahead and knock those out now. And so we get our one, zero, minus one, zero, zero, one, one, zero. Now, what do I know? I know lead, <coughs> lead. What's this guy? Free. So if I would solve this, if I want to solve for x, y, so that tells me that x3 is free. So x3 can be free. If x3 is if x3 is free, what does that make x2? Minus infinity. What does that make x1? This is one of the nice things about this particular problem by putting it in reduced row echelon form. Makes it really easy to solve. You just move the freeze and there's no uh, oh, resubstitute and everything. Just move them over. You just subtract them to the other side or they'll go pretty quick. And so what does that mean? That tells us that the x's that go to zero look like alpha minus alpha alpha. What does that look like? Alpha times one minus one, one. And so null space of A has that. So what's obviously the span? There's only one. <laughs> There's only one. Vector. It's like, is it independent? Yes. And so what have I just learned? I've learned that the null space of A is the span of this one vector. I don't need to check for independence because it's just one. I also learned that the dimension of the null space of A happens to be one. So if I would go back to my problem, So over here is R2. Over here is R3. There's the zero object. There's the zero object. But what does the null space of A look like? It's the span of a single vector, which means it's what? It's a line. It's a one-dimensional object. 
Because why? It's a one-dimensional object. And what would that look like? What direction does it point in? 1x, negative 1y, 1z. So this way, this way, up, back. And so it would be going in this direction. So that vector in this direction is going to be this line in 3 space ends up being the null space of A. Anything, any vector along that line is going to get mapped to right there. And so I've learned a piece of information by being able to do things like solve a system of equations, and this is dimensions. Now, note, uh, this will show up a lot. So we'll have the following definition. The dimension of the null space of A is called A's Nullity. What a wonderful name. The nullity of A is the dimension of the null space of A. All right. So I've learned that this matrix A, one, two, one. Negative one zero one has obviously somehow tells me properties of the three dimensional space, and the first thing I studied is the stuff that goes to zero. But it, would it make sense that A probably, since it's moving things around, creates features on the codomain as well, like normal functions when you you have the domain and you have the codomain. The domain is things like, what are the stuff that, for example, is allowed to go into a function? Like if you take the square root of x plus 1. Well, I, I don't want to have square root of negative numbers. So there are certain things in the domain that would be problematic because they would go to you know, other things. Another thing that we have other words for if we look at an at a output is the range. Where do you really go? And where do you not go? So this matrix multiplying these vectors probably has things on the right side that are kind of like the range. You know, the, the stuff that you get mapped to and the stuff that you don't get mapped to. And so what we're going to try to figure out a little bit is, can we study A a little bit more and somehow on this figure out that this side over here probably going to get broke up into things that kind of like are like a range and kind of like the stuff that you don't go to and how can we study those but what's special about A that's going to do this and to do that study is we're going to go back to A itself and look at the things in it which are its rows and its columns most likely are, are obviously going to do something really important. There's the thing that are doing the multiplying. So for this section, 3.6, we're going to study the rows of A and the columns of A. In particular, when I study the rows of A, and then I'm going to study the columns of A, and so we have what is A? A is a bunch of stuff. Like A11, A12, up to A1N, down to AM1, AM2, up to AMN. I could think of A as being just a block of numbers. But on the other hand, I could say, you know what? A has a bunch of rows. It's the first row all the way down to the nth row. It also could be, can, can, can be considered a bunch of columns. It would be A's first column, A's second column, all the way to A's nth column. This is M by N. A is M by N. How many rows, how many columns? So if I wanted to, I could, hey, let's look at the rows. Or other times, hey, let's look at the columns. Now, what are the sizes of A's rows? Let's go back here. A is what? 2 by 3. 
How much stuff is in a row of A? Three. Three. Right? Each row is a three tuple. How much stuff is in a column of A? Two. So it's a two tuple. Right? It has two things in it, two tuple. It has three things in it, three tuple. What's the word tuple? It means order matters. So if you say five tuple, I have five things in order obviously matters. If I go in across the row, each one of those represents being related to one of the things that you're multiplying, right? X1, X2, X3. <coughs> if I go down a column, each one of those was related to one of the equations of the systems of equations. Oh, I'm taking some out of the first, I'm taking some out of the second, but order matters. All right. So this thing is every row is a n-tuple object. Every column is a m-tuple object. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at each of those and ask, let's look at their span. Consider the span of A1, A2, up to AM. Take each of these row vectors and span it, which is just take any row combination, right? Some multiple of row 1 plus some multiple of row 2. Obviously, this will spit out a row vector. And the question is, the span is going to be what? It's going to be a subspace of what particular dimension? What are the dimensions of every one of these rows? They're n-dimensional, right? It's an n-tuple. So this will be a subset of the nth dimension. And it's going to be a full it's going to be a full subspace because all spans are subspace. Why does it include the zero object? Just the zero of the first, zero of the second, zero of the third, right? So it includes the zero object, it's closed, this thing is a subspace. These things are n-tuples, so it's a subspace of Rn. Now normally what you would do is, if I would look at it, well, Rn is like columns. It's like, yeah, but an n-tuple is an n-tuple. If you decide to write it as a column or you decide to write it as a row, right, it's still an n-tuple. So it's still in this dimensional space. The other thing that I could consider is the span of A's columns. And this is going to be a subspace of R what? How big are the columns? They're M tuples. So this is a subspace of Rm, again, because these are M tuples. So if I span the rows, it's a subspace. If I span the columns, it's a subspace. But since this subspace is based upon rows, what special name do you think we're going to call this? And when you look at the title of this section, row space and column space. And so what we're going to do is call this here the row space of A. I'm going to call this guy the column space of A. Okay, so idea so far, here's A over here. This side is R M, this side is R N. 
somewhere in here is going to be a subspace which is going to be and made created by the rows of A. Because each, as I go across the row, right, it's multiplying one of the vectors x, which is nth dimensional. So I take A's rows, consider them as columns for a second, and then I can say, all right, this span is going to be somewhere over here. On the other hand, I'm going to have some other object over here, which is go going to be the column space of A. And so A is M by N. So in the same way, the null space is kind of like a part of the left-hand side. The row space of A is a part of the left. And the column space of A is some sort of part of the right. So let's study these things for a second and see if there's anything that might be interesting in the two. So just like the null space, we could ask, what's the basis? What's its dimension? So we could find a nullity and say, all right, the null space is on the left-hand side, and we studied it by setting it equal to 0, solving it, everything that possibly goes to 0. We could write it as a basis, figure out how many of those things are that are independent. That's going to be its dimension. That's going to be the basis. So we studied the null space. Now let's figure out the same concept of figuring out the row space. Now. The row space is a linear combination of A's rows. One, two, one, negative one, zero, one. Remember how we did the null space thing? And we did what what was the idea of finding the null space? I was solving this thing equal to zero, zero. But what did we really do? What you were doing is you were doing row operations. And so like I said, oh look, row two plus row one equals new row two, and that was one, two, one, zero, two, two. And then I would say things like, okay, I'm going to subtract those two, and that would be 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 2, 2. And then I would take things like 1 half of row 2, and that would eventually be coming 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 1. And eventually this became U, so this started off as A. And then I did row ops until you showed up, and this one was reduced row echelon form. Now I had to do that for figuring out the null space, but I did it. Now, here's the deal. How did I get a new row 2? I took a linear combination of row 1 and row 2. Well, how did I make a new row 1? I took a linear combination of row 2 and row 1. How did I get a new row 2? I took a linear combination of row 2 and row 1. I used no row 1s and a half row 2. Every row op was a linear combination. What would that tell you about the row space? A row space is what are all linear combinations? Well, this guy is a linear combination of those guys, so that would mean all linear combinations of this are obviously going to be all linear combinations of that, because I just did a linear combination. But that would tell me all the linear combinations of A, A's rows, would still be all the linear combinations of U's rows. Because I did linear combinations to make it. 
And so we get our first theorem here. <coughs> Which is, if you do linear combinations, you're forming row equivalency matrices. And so two row equivalent matrices have same row space. So example, A, 1, 2, 1, negative 1, 0, 1. What is the row space of A? It is the span of what? 1, 2, 1, and negative 1, 0, 1, and we do all this work, right? And it's like, well, are they independent? Do I have to do anything else that's really hard to it? But by that theorem, we did this u was actually 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 1, right? Well, the row space of this is much easier to see. It's the span of 1, 0, minus 1, and 0, 1, 1. What does this theorem say? They're equal. Um, example, 1, 2, 1, negative 1, 0, 1, 1, 4, 3, zero, four, four, that's A. So if I just wrote the row space right now, it would be the span of one, two, one, negative one, zero, one, one, four, three, zero, four, four, but I have the question of, are they linearly independent? <laughs> it's like, and when you check for linear independence, the easiest way to do it was you just simply transpose all those and then just use your old skill set. It's like, hey, I just transpose it and then write it the way we normally think about it. But you look at this and say, all right, that's, I don't know if there's linear independence or what. There's, there's four objects. So if I want to find the row space of A and try to figure it out, I'm going to have to say, well, it's the span of what? Well, it's its dimension. And the easiest way to do it is to say, well, why don't we just go ahead, I'm probably for the null space going to have to set it equal to zero anyway and do all these row ops. Let's just do that. So if I do that, let's just do the row ops. So this guy would become 1, 2, 1, 0, 2, 2, 1, 4, 3, 0, 4, 4, right? But then how would I make that guy zero? I would subtract the two, and so one minus one would be what? Zero. Zero. Four minus two? Two. Two. Three minus one? Two. Two. Well, that's just zero, two, two. So what is that? One, two, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one. Well, I'm going to subtract those guys. And so what is it? One, two, one, zero, one, one, zero, 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 zero. So what is the span? It's the span of those four. Uh, I really don't care about the span of the zero object. So what's this is, and if I would go one more step, knock it down up above, I shouldn't say equal, that would become uh, one, zero, minus one, zero, one, one, zero, 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 zero. In other words, that was my u. It's like, hey, I now have that. The row space of A, which was the span of all those four. That theorem says, just put it in reduced row echelon form. Which ones would I keep? Just those two that don't that aren't all zero, and so I would have I would have one zero minus one and zero one one. And so when I look at this, I could say, hey, what's the dimension? 
of the row space of A. Two. Two dimensional object. Could you, how many of you here, obviously what did I do to make that? I started off with two I knew were independent and then I just took linear combinations to make something that I knew was obviously going to be dependent. But if you looked at those four right there, does it look like there's just two independent ones? It's like, I don't know, I need to do the work. Well, how do you do the work? Just put it, do the same stuff you would do for solving for the null space. Just do the row operations and since linear combinations of rows is linear combinations of rows, you're not going to do anything bad. And the last two, all non-zero, where I don't have the, the last two non-zero rows here are the ones that will form the basis. Definition. What is the dimension of the null space called the nullity of a matrix. What is the definition for the dimension of row space of A is called the rank of A. So in terms of term, it's like what's the rank of a matrix? The rank of the matrix is going to be the dimension of this guy. Now, here's a nice little byproduct, though. If you look at that, if you look at U, um, where are my lead variables? there and there. So that's a lead, that's a lead. Well, if you weren't a lead variable, you would be a what? Free variable. Now, the dimension of the row space is when I put this in reduced row echelon form, I would look for the rows that are not all zeros, right? But if they don't have all zeros, obviously on the rows that don't have all zeros, they're going to have a lead. Because if there isn't a lead, it's all zeros. In other words, the same number of lead variables that you see is going to be the same number of rows that are not all zeros. So it ends up being that when I look at this, how could you count the rank? The rank is how many lead variables are there. So that's another thing that we would have. This is equal to number of lead variables. Remember, the nullity of A was equal to the dimension of the null space of A. Let's go back to one of the ones that we just did. Do, 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 do. Or do I have an arrow? There it is. <sighs> the dimension of the null space. Where did that come from? It came from the freeze. What's the free variable? Alpha. What's the next free variable? Beta, right? And then what happens? You would write all those guys, you'd factor it out, and you would write it this way, and it would end up being that, okay, every free is going to be used for figuring out a vector for the basis for the null space. And so it ends up being that for the dimension of the null space is just going to be, that's always going to be equal to the number of free variables. So how many free variables do you have? Well, that's going to be the dimension, so you better make sure you got it right. So back here to the end. The nullity is equal to number of free variables. 
And so obviously there's a nice little theorem here. What do you think the nullity of A plus the rank of A is going to have to be? Number of variables. Like how many variables do you got? <laughs> what are the freeze used for? The null space. What are the leads used for? That helps me figure out the column space. In the column space, how many of there are is going to be the rank. How many free variables there are, which is the dimension of the null space, is going to be the nullity. And it ends up that both of these add to n. So what's going to happen here is my left-hand side has been a little bit better defined. That would mean if I would go to this, see that row space of A? And if I would have over here the null space of A, the dimension of this plus the dimension of this is the entire dimension. So these are going to somehow be related like, oh, that means if the null space is one dimensional, but my entire space is four dimensional, that means that this guy's going to have to be three. And they're in a way kind of like this idea of they're not, they're complementary. They're different. They're somehow related to one another, but together they're going to, eventually what we're going to show is together they'll span the entire space. And so we're taking the space and breaking it up into two spanning groups, the null and the column. And together, it's back to the space. All right. So, did I say the column, the null, and the row? Get my words right. OK. Let's we'll study A's column, which is column space of A. Note, AX equals B can be thought of as X1 times A1 plus x2 times a2 plus everything up to xn times a n is supposed to be equal to b. What's another word for that? It's a linear combination of a's columns. What is the column space? All linear combinations of A's columns. This is a linear combo of A's columns. Now, the first test talked in particular about the only way there's a theorem that I asked you to know. The only way this could be possibly equal is if a linear combination of A's columns spit out B. Like if I want to solve this, this says a linear combination of A's columns spits out B. That means I could actually take that entire theorem and just change it. AX equals B has a solution if B is in A's column space. It won't have a solution if B is not in A's column space. I shouldn't say if. It's actually if and only if. These are logically equivalent. What this means now is it ends up at the column space. So here's A. Here is so there is R N. This is R M. This means that this guy right here, being the column space of A, if I think of A as being a function, that means the column space is the actual <coughs> range. 
It's where you actually go to. So what happens here is this entire space gets mapped to this subspace. And where you go is the range. And now we actually have something that kind of makes sense. Solve this. And you look at it and say, uh, you're asking me for when x squared crosses that line. It doesn't. How do I know that? It's not in its range. It never goes there. When does it cross this line? Twice. How do you know that? It's in its range. It goes there. So all of a sudden for these matrices, we have this idea of if you want to solve, hey, which x is over here, map to this b right here. It's like, is that b in the range? And if the answer is no, the answer is it's inconsistent. It has no solution. It doesn't go there. Well, what if it's in that place? It has a solution. So all of a sudden, solving becomes, well, who goes here? Well, it's so if I had a matrix that mapped all of three-dimensional space to the floor, and I ask, okay, which vector in three space maps to this arrow that's coming out of the floor? And the answer is none. You try to solve it, everything goes to the floor. That's the range. If you're out of the range, it's not going to work. So solving this is just simply saying, are you in the column space? The column space is actually being in the range of this function. So it's another term for it. So that's physically what's going on. Another theorem behind that. Would be. If you want to solve AX equals B. And it is consistent. For all b's in the entire other space. So now this is like saying, all right, uh, who maps to these vectors? And it's like, well, instead of looking at a specific vector, does it? Can I handle everybody? Is really what this is asking is: is the codomain equal to the range? Do you go everywhere? Like x squared, the answer would be no. X cubed, the answer is yes. Everything from negative to infinity to infinity is mapped. And so the codomain is the range. You go everywhere. And in other words, you have consistency. You can possibly go everywhere if and only if the column vectors of A span all of the space. You go everywhere if you span everywhere. Right? Going everywhere means literally going everywhere. If we want consistency for everywhere, but only one solution for everywhere, So then, then it would be like, not only do you have to span, they need to be linearly independent. So if the column vectors are linearly independent, not only do you go everywhere, where you go is simply one place. In other words, I have one solution for each of them. An obvious byproduct of this or corollary is if you have a square matrix, this will be non singular if and only if 
the column vectors are a basis. of Rn. It's n by n, that means we have n vectors. If n vectors are linearly independent, then they form a basis for that space. And therefore it's going to be invertible. Okay. So we're still in column space, but you can actually tell us something about the column space, even though u was what we used before for the row space as well as the null space. So if we go back to our example of uh, 1, 2, 1, negative 1. 0, 1, we do our row ops, so that was my A, and then U is equal to uh, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 1. Is that right? So you did all of this work. Now, for row space stuff, what are things that you can tell us? Tells us about the null space. Just set it equal to zero, solve it. You can figure out the dimension and the basis for the null space. It also can tell us about the row space and the nullity of A, which is the dimension of the row space. Sorry, the nullity of A is the dimension of the null space. The row space, its dimension, which is going to be the rank, the sum of these two is just the total number of variables as you go through it. That's all the things that we've already done. But one thing that's also true is it can tell us something about the columns themselves. Now, I do row ops, and that's obviously messing around with the column's values. But if I would look at u, It can at least tell us about the linear relationships of the column. So u was equal to 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 1. And when I look at this, I would say things like, OK, uh, this guy was free. These two were leads, right? And I could say, this is u's first column. This is u's second column. This is u's third column. Now, this column right here, which doesn't have any lead variables in it, has dependencies upon those columns. What do I notice? I notice that u3 is made up, if, if u1 is 1, 0, and u2 is 0, 1, I notice that u3 in standard basis looks like u3 is a minus u1 plus a U2. Because why? I have minus one of those and one of those. 
And you can go ahead and check it, right? You could say, what is U3? Negative 1, 1. Is that equal to minus 1, 0 and a plus 0, 1? Yes. And so what do I have? I have dependency. U3 is dependent upon U1 and U2 as a column concept. What's nice, though, is the following theorem. The linear dependency equations of U are same in A. In other words, for example, U's third column is negative 1, U's first column plus U's second column. That is easy to see because it's in reduced row echelon form. But that immediately says that what? A's third column is minus A's first column plus A's second column. Well, we can check that. What was A? It was this 1, 2, 1, negative 1, 0, 1. Now, when I look at that, it is not obvious to me that the third column is minus the 1 plus the other. But is it? What is A3? 1, 1. That's A3. What is minus A1? That's 1, negative 1. Plus A2. 2, 0. I didn't do a minus there. Minus. Is that the same dependency? Yes, it is. So now we actually, when you look at this, that means go all the way back to A. The column space of A was equal to what? It's the span of 1, negative 1, 2, 0, 1, 1. Think about all the way back to the beginning when I had that whole, that one problem number seven of whatever section and we wrote this this way and I had those, was it two or three? Was it three? There were three column vectors of length four. And it's like, are they linearly independent to figure out if they're a basis? There's nothing for me to do. If I went ahead and solved all of my work already for you, the linear dependency equations of U are the linear dependency equations of A. So because of that, A3 is a linear combination of A1, A2. So guess what? It's not needed. We could see that by, if you've already studied the row space, you get to the U, the U gives you extra information. It talks about the column dependency. And so if I want to find that span, I can toss that because linear dependency. A3 is a linear combination of the other two, so therefore the span is simply 1, negative 1, and 2, 0. And that would mean that the dimension of the column space of A was they had three columns, but one of them is linear independent. Get rid of it. Its dimension is actually two. Which actually tells us what about the range? It's two dimensional. Now, the other thing that will happen here is. We can take advantage of looking back at what happens on this problem. What do I notice of the dependency equations? The columns that end up being dependent are the ones that don't have a lead variable, right? And so that would mean that who are the only ones that matter? Who has a lead variable? Well, but number of lead variables is another way of counting the rank. So it ends up being that the dimension of the column space 
is also going to be the rank. So we looked at this and said, okay, there's, there's transform concepts in here. And from the study of A, if you would go ahead and take A, do all your row operations until you get some sort of U that's in reduced row echelon form. Once you get it to reduced row echelon form, you can start answering some particular questions. You know, from this particular stuff, you could figure out, okay, what's the null space of A? What's its dimension? What's its basis? One second, well, I might put it in the order. It's the basis, and how many elements in the basis will be its dimension. Another word for the dimension of the null space would be called the what? The nullity, right, for it as you go through it. And so what were some other objects that we would get from this? Obviously, you use U to do that. We could also study, so we could study that. The other thing that we could study is the the row space of A and how would we find the the uh, we could have this I'm not you know how do you find the null space you solve when this thing equals zero right which it really means you just augment the u with the zero and you solve it you say oh this is a free variable that's an alpha, this is a free variable, that's a beta, this is a free variable, that's an eta. And you solve it all and you get some bunches of, you know, all those three variables and you pull them, pull them out, you write them as a sum, a linear combination, and it ends up being that, okay, those are the things that generate my null space. Where is the null space? It's over on this side, right? And so over here somewhere would be something that's definitely going to include the zero object. If it's one dimensional, like that would be like the null space of A is a one dimensional object. Could be two dimensional, like a plane, but it's always going to cut through the, the zero because it's the subspace. It has to include the zero. What does the null space represent? It's everything on the left that gets mapped to the zero object on the right. Then we ask for the row space of A. Where's the row space of A? It's going to be over here. There's a there's an object over here that's the row space of A, whatever it looks like, I don't know. Maybe do it like this. And so that thing there would be the row space of A. How's it represented? You go to U, you look for those non-zero rows, and those are the guys who are most important, right? And those rows written as columns would be the basis of this. How many of them there are there would be the dimension of the row space, right? And so how do you find the row space of A? You would find its basis by looking at U and then taking the non-zero rows as basis but then you would, obviously, you would write as columns because the normal way you would write a vector that generates a space is normally in column form. So you say, ah, let's take this, write it as a column. That's going to be my basis. How many, of them, how many of them are is going to be its dimension? What's the dimension of the row space also called? Rank. Rank. And so the dimension of the row space, which is... How many of these things are in here? How many non-zero rows do you have? That's equal, that's called the rank of A. What do I know about the nullity of A plus the rank of A? Has to be N, right? Because one counts the free variables, one counts the lead variables. So it has to be the same. It's just how many variables did you have? Which is going to be the dimension of this space here. So for example, if this was R3 and I found that the null space was one dimensional, I definitely know that the column space is going to have to be two dimensional because I have three dimensions to work with. And so those two things, you know, are going to be talking about the, le the left hand side. The other side, we could talk about the column space. Or, why does it keep going? So three. The column space of A. 
what's the important part about the column space? You look back at U, but U is like, well, but U is reduced rows. But there's a property of U that's going to be useful for the columns, which is going to be what? U will have linear dependency equations that are associated with it. Those same dependencies of U are going to be the same dependencies for A. And you use that to form, hey, who's not dependent? Who are the true independent columns? Which would be the guys that have the least variables. Everybody else will be dependent upon those. And so that tells you the dimension of this. And another word for the column space, we could say it's the range. This entire space of the left gets mapped to the range. This is where you go. It's the linear combination of the columns. And so for the column space of A, you would look at U and find the linear dependence equations of it and A has same linear dependence. Use above to find the basis of column space. An example of something like that would have been this. We'll say that you had A, you do all your row ops, and you find out that U is equal to 1, uh, 0, 0, 0, and then 2, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0, 0, a negative 1, 3, Zero and a zero, zero zero one, zero and a two one one zero. <coughs> so we get that. I started started off with A. I did all my row ops. Uh, what was the size of A? It was four by six. It's, if it's 4 by 6, if you did all of this work and you kind of play around with it, you would notice that I'm taking what? I'm taking 6-dimensional space, multiplying everything in here by A, and it's spitting out a 4th-dimensional space. So what are some pieces of it? If I did all this work, I don't know what A is. If I did all this work, um, how would you handle the null space of A? The null space of A is what? When does this equal zero? How do you do it? You set A and you augment it with zero, 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 and you do what? Row ops. And it ends up being that if you would like to have AX equals zero, that's the same thing as obviously being UX equals zero. There's no difference between it's just row operations. This has the same X. So that would mean that one zero 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 two zero 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 one zero zero negative one three zero 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 one zero and two one one zero augmented oop zero 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 all right how do you solve that you go through here and you say there's a lead there's a lead there's a lead. What does it make everybody else? Free. Free. So that tells me what? What is x for? I'm looking for all x. This is true, right? I would like to find x, which is made up of x1, x2, x3, x4. Sorry, x5, x6. <laughs> Let's go and get the correct, correct number in here. x5, x6. I would like to have this thing equal to 0, 0, 0, and I'd like to find all that. Well, what is x6 since it's free? It's something, so let's just call it, say, alpha 1. Um, what does that make x4? Free. So what do you want to call it? I don't know. Let's call it alpha 2. Uh, what does that make x2? Free. What can it be? Anything. So let's call x2 alpha 3. 
Because those are free. Okay, now, um, if x6 is alpha 1, what does that make alpha 5? You would just move that to that side, right? And so just by observation, I could sit there and say, well, wait a second, just looking at this row right here, that row tells me that x5 is equal to minus alpha 1. What does that make um, x3? Look at this row right there. x3 is 3x4s and 1x6. So I'd move those to the other side. And x3, moving those to the other side, would be what? Minus 3, alpha 2s, minus a, alpha 1. So we're okay with that row, that equation, having that solution. Okay? So we'll solve that one. And then we look at this guy here, which is who do I not yet know? I don't know. Alpha 1. But what is alpha 1? It's 2 alpha 2s. Negative 1. Sorry, sorry. 2 alpha 3s negative one alpha twos and two alpha ones. So I just move those to the other side and I would get x1 is equal to minus two alpha threes, a plus alpha two and a minus two alpha one. So we would write that all down. x1, nice and ugly, negative two alpha one plus an alpha two minus 2 alpha 3, uh, x2 was just alpha 3, x3 was this minus alpha 1, minus 3 alpha 2's, and then does x3, and so x4 was alpha 2, and then x5 was minus alpha 1, and then the last one was alpha 1. Should be able to solve. But that's not normally how we write that. How would you write that? You would write that as a linear combination. What is x? Alpha 1 times what? Negative 2. Negative 2. 0. Minus 1. 0. Minus 1. 1. What would that be? One, zero, zero. Negative, three. negative three, one, one. Zero. Zero. and then alpha three. And so this, once you have it in this form, we can say the null space of A what is the basis? This, comma, this, right? You put it here, put it there, and then this one would go here. What is the nullity of A? What's the dimension? Three. I have three of those. That's just the first part. What would you do then for the row space? You would look back at you, and the row space would be what? That, that, and that, written as columns, would be my basis for the row space. So what's the dimension of that? Three. So what's the rank of A? Three. Does it make sense if the nullity is 3 and the rank of A is 3? How many total variables did we have on our space? 6. 3 for one, 3 for the other, 6. So that one's easy. The, the row space is, hey, take your non-zeros, write them as columns. That's your basis.
So because of that, the basis of row space is simply 1, 2, 0, negative 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 3, 0, 1, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. And obviously, the rank of A is 3, because there's three things there. And the last thing that we would study is the column space. To do the column space, you have to look at U. And the whole point of the column space is that you have to find linear dependencies of the columns. I'm in the column space. I want the linear dependencies of the columns. When we look at this, obviously the reduced part are the things that matter. Everything else is dependent on them. So when I do this, what do I, if I would look at this guy right here, what do I notice about the sixth column of U? It is two of this one, one of this one, and one of that one. So it ends up being that, oh, just by comparison, this is actually two U1 plus U3 plus U5. Then we look at this one. What is U4? Just compare negative one of that, three of that. So it's minus U1 plus three U3. And then what does U2 become? Two U1. Just U1 times 2, which moves it right over. Why does that work? Because it's just ones, and it's, it's the, it's the uh, standard bases, right? There's zeros everywhere, ones in this position. So, ah, how many of those? Well, what, what number do I see? That's just what I need to get that. Now, these are the, line the linear dependency of the columns of U. The theorem says if it works for U, it has to work for A. And so, what that would mean is. A's six column, even though I didn't even write it down. I absolutely know that A's six column is going to be two. A's first column plus A's, keep writing, make it look my U's and A's looking too close together. A's first column plus A's third column plus A's fifth column. A's fourth is negative A1 plus three A3. A's second column is going to be twice A's first column. In other words, when we do the basis, the basis is obviously going to be, you look back here and say, which columns were the lead of the U's? Those are the columns you'll pick for the basis of A as the column space. So that would be A1, A3, and A5. whatever they are. Because what is everybody else? Everybody else is a linear combination of those. That means linear dependent didn't need them. They're not necessary. In the column space <coughs> is going to be over on this side over here. And so if you do this work, and this is the things that we need to be able to do, Given any matrix, you should be able to take the row ops and put it in reduced row echelon form. Once you have it in reduced row echelon form, you can look at it and then just work through all of these steps. What's the null space? What's the nullity? What's the row space? What's the rank? What's the column space? What's the basis for every single one of those? What are the vectors that make up the thing that generates the entire subspace of interest? Everybody okay with that? We're not okay, but make sure that you're able to do this.